Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Try and Palace Live. My name is Matt Arthur. I'm the Living History Program Coordinator here at the Palace, and we are here in my favorite building to talk about some of my favorite things today, and that's 18th century fun food facts. So we're going to cover a wide spectrum today. And as we're going along, if you have any uh, comments, questions, screams, cries for help, just put them down in the comments. And uh, when I get to the end of my top 10, uh, I'll be happy to answer any of them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing I want to talk about today are the things in this little jar. These are cochineal beetles and our 18th century dye stuffs. Now, we use them in the kitchen office to make a red food coloring, but in the 18th century, they're also used to make cosmetics, although women in the colonies notoriously didn't wear cosmetics, um, and they are used as a dye stuff for cloth. Now, this was very precious. It was high-quality dye stuff. In fact, Cochineal beetle, which is a relative to a pill bug, a roly-poly, um, potato bug, everybody seems to have a different name for them. Uh, these little ladies, because each one of those little beetles that you saw was a female, live on nopal cactus that's native from about Mexico all the way down through South America. In the 18th century and before, once these were discovered, it was in mostly Spanish-held territory. The Spanish introduced this dye to Europe, and everyone went crazy for it. It could make a beautiful scarlet, depending on how you treated the dye. Everybody wanted some. And Spain didn't want to give away any of the secrets, and people had never seen it before in Europe, and they had questions about what it was. Is it a bug? Is it a seed? Is it a seed that you plant and it grows something that's kind of like a bug? Uh, national spy rings were launched to try to figure out the secret behind this dye. And all it is, is the females of a beetle species, they drink the juices off of the nopal cactus. The males have wings and they fly from colony to colony to make sure that there are more cochineal beetles. But the females have a dye called car uh, carminic acid inside them that makes them bitter as a natural defense. And that's the dye stuff. So in the 18th century, what we want to do is take these, put them in a mortar and pestle, Grind them up. And you can already see it. It's giving kind of a burgundy color in here. And now we can take this powder to make uh, the food coloring. We can just dump this into what I've got here is some proof spirits. And if I swirl it around, What we've got here is almost a blood red. You can get with cochineal anything from a scarlet to a purpley color, a purpley pink color. Um, it just depends on how you treat it. So this makes a great red food coloring in the 18th century. We still use it as a natural food coloring today. And you'll also find it in your all natural cosmetics as well. So that's cochineal, the prime 18th century dye stuff. I love studying food history because it covers the history of people, countries, and all of that. Um, founding fathers are fascinating people, and most people think if they're going to think of a founding foodie, they'll think of Thomas Jefferson. Um, by all rights, he had an amazing garden, he kept amazing journals, but one of my favorite ones to talk about is Ben Franklin. Ben had his fingers in everything. And two of my favorite ones, just to share quickly, is that Ben Franklin is the first American to mention tofu in writing. We have a letter that was shared from Ben Franklin to a friend of his, uh, John Bartram, who was a naturalist. In this letter, uh, Mr. Franklin says that he is sending some beans. He calls them Chinese garavances. Um, garavance is a corruption of the word garbanzo. So he's basically saying that these are Chinese chickpeas that he's sending to Mr. Bartram, um, and that the Chinese use them to make a type of cheese called tofu, and he gives the rough instructions that he found um, that had been translated by a, a missionary to China. 
Um, we don't know if uh, Mr. Franklin ever successfully made or tried tofu. Uh, he doesn't mention it. He tends to talk about his um, food explorations. Um, and a good example of that is one of my other favorite Ben Franklin food facts. And that is, he thought that turkeys that were killed by electrocution were much more tender than a regular turkey. Um, the man who is most famous for playing with kites in electrical storms, it's probably not that big of a surprise. Um, he was quite fond of this, and he once tried to demonstrate it at a Christmas party. Uh, unfortunately, in front of the crowd, something went wrong, and he ended up shocking himself and could very well have killed himself. Um, the turkey, I'm not sure if it ever got a full reprieve or not. All we know is that Mr. Franklin was embarrassed about this situation, and actually we know about it because he'd sent a letter to a family member basically saying, please don't tell anyone about this. Back to actual food, though, here in the kitchen office. What I have here is one of the pieces of faux food. You might remember that I make faux food here at the palace. This was a piece made by um, one of my predecessors, but it's a wonderful representation of what we know in the 18th century as a coffin crust. Now, I know everyone has been getting really into home baking. There was a yeast shortage for a while. Um, Pastry, which is one of, I love baking. Pastry is my nemesis. I've just got to work on that. They had lots of options for pastry in the 18th century. They have short crusts, they have puff pastry, and they have hot water crusts. And a, a coffin crust is a type of hot water crust, but it serves as 18th century Tupperware. You melt the fat into the water, you mix in the flour, um, you work it to get the gluten to develop you stand, you bake this. Um, the pies tend to be savory, meat pies. They can be, have highly elaborately decorated tops. And then when you serve them, you cut the top off and you scoop out the filling onto the plates. Once you are done with that meal, you may very well have leftovers and that's fine. What we'll do is we'll fill the pie back up with hot gelatin that'll set and cut off the oxygen to the pie, which will keep the pie from going bad. We know in the 18th century, people were eating from coffin crust pies for up to a week sometimes. Now, once the pie shell is empty, this pie crust is not made to be eaten. It's not going to be very tasty. It's made to be durable. And durable food is not usually the best tasting. Uh, sometimes a coffin crust would be used multiple times. And when it was too rough to be used, they would grate it into a soup to thicken as the, the breadcrumbs. So we're getting as much bang for our buck out of a coffin crust as we can. Now I do sometimes get asked, why is it called a coffin crust? That's not horribly appetizing. It actually comes from a French word that means basket. Unfortunately, I cannot pronounce French to save my life. So we're just going to say it comes from a French word that means basket. <laughs> Um, let's move on to what I have in this bottle. It is not wine. This is a bottle that holds 18th century ketchup that we made here in the kitchen office. Um, now it's a very liquidy uh, thing. I'm not sure if you can hear it or not, but there is definitely liquid going around in this bottle. Ketchup in the 18th century is not your Heinz ketchup that you know today. It's not tomato based. If you want ketchup in the 18th century, you have a couple of options. The main ones are mushroom ketchup or walnut-based ketchup. Now, there, um, the recipe that we make in the kitchen ketchup because it doesn't use walnuts or uh, mushrooms. All of these recipes, though, have anchovies in them. And that is actually where ketchup gets its name. It comes from an Indonesian word that means fish sauce. And so having anchovies in there is very true to the origins of ketchup. We make one, the one that we make, we make in a day here at the kitchen office and it needs to be bottled for at least a week before it's um, used. Mushroom and walnut ketchups usually take a couple of days to make. They're pretty involved we start seeing tomato ketchup 
in um, the first recipe we know of is in 1812, when a science and horticulturalist, James Meese, writes a recipe uh, for ketchup that uses love apples, which is a period name for tomatoes. You see it used on occasion. Um, with spices and brandy. That's it. It's missing two key ingredients that we find in our, t our ketchup today, which is sugar and vinegar. Those things start moving into the recipe in the 1870s, and Mr. Hines hops on the ketchup bandwagon shortly thereafter. But in the 18th century, instead of dunking you know, French fries or anything like that into your ketchup, what you're doing is you're using it like you would Worcestershire sauce, and our ketchup smells like Worcestershire sauce. We use it to add it into dishes to add depth of flavor. Speaking of flavor, if you want big, bold flavors, you have an option in 18th century coffee. Now, what I have here are green coffee beans. And in the 18th century, coffee comes green into port. Uh, there are discussions, just like there are today, of how dark do you want your coffee? How darkly do you roast it? Some people said they just wanted a little color on it, basically like a blonde roast. Uh, some people uh, argued for the period term is torrifying it, which is basically almost so roasted that you can't use it anymore. It's too burnt. Uh, so we have a wide spectrum. You make it on, to your own liking. Uh, there's also people who say, you know, you leave the beans whole. People say that you crush the beans like we do today. And there are people who say, you know, argue about do you make it in water? Do you make it in milk? Um, how do you go about doing all this? So it's a very varied subject. But people love coffee in the 18th century. Starbucks has nothing on us. The 18th century coffee houses were all the rage. A, a city had arrived when they had a coffee house, and they were sometimes called penny universities because you could go pay about a penny for a cup of coffee, hang out all day long. All of the intelligentsia of the town tended to hang out there. You could read the newspapers and get informed. On, in a, you can have an education by hanging out all day long for buying a cup of coffee and just listening to what's going on around you. In London, it's a coffee house that is the start of the London Stock Exchange. Jonathan's Coffee House in, um, in the 18th century is the start of the London Stock Exchange. They are places where men go, and they are more men's clubs than anything. Um, and Newburn has its own coffee house. So if you're here in Newburn and you know your Newburn geography, if you go to um, near where Craven Street and South Front Street meet, that's about where the coffee house was in the 18th century, and it was run by a man named Andrew Mack. So that is one of the signs that New Bern is a proper modern 18th century city. I love the fact that here in the kitchen office, we try to use as much from our kitchen garden as we can when we cook our 18th century meals. And while today we talk about the fact that we need to eat a lot of vegetables, we need uh, the benefit of not overcooking our vegetables and cooking all the vitamins and all of that out of them, the 18th century approaches veg in a completely different mindset. Vegetables are seen a bit as poor people food. That's something anybody can get. Rich people are the ones who can afford a lot of meat. So a high class house is going to not revel in a whole bunch of vegetables if they can help it. And people in the 18th century are also a suspect of raw vegetables. Um, now, in the 18th century, we have a layered salad called salmagundi, and you have different types of lettuce and greens. Sometimes it's calls for endive. But then the other layers are white meat chicken, dark meat chicken, egg whites, egg yolks, and um, sardines or anchovies all of these things layered up. So veg are not necessarily the star of the show in that salad, but they are, is an example of people eating raw vegetables. But kind of the general idea for a lot of folks was that raw veg could cause anything from indigestion all the way to the plague. So it was probably best not to risk it. Um, vegetables are cooked, um, and sometimes cooked a lot. I've had wonderful 18th century vegetable dishes, and then there are some that are definitely strange to a modern uh, mindset. One of those is we have a recipe for chicken with peas and lettuce, and that actually cooks the peas and the lettuce with the chicken. 
Um, the, the lettuce tends to wilt, and sometimes it seems to have completely melted into the broth by the time it's done, but it does add a nice little green taste to it. Uh, one of the other ones that uh, people have very strong feelings about is something called a forced cucumber, where you peel the cucumber, either cut the top off or cut it long ways, hollow it out, make your favorite stuffing recipe, shove the stuffing inside the cucumber, tie or sew the top back onto the cucumber, and then cook it in broth. Um, it's an acquired taste. I like it, but it took me a while to get there. Um, but it's an example of a vegetable that we tend to think of as a veg that you eat raw being prepared and cooked in a way. Um, to deviled eggs. Now, I love a good deviled egg. I'm a proud southern boy um, as far as my food choices go a lot of times. But deviled eggs uh, have an 18th century history, but they go back even further than that. I started looking into the history of deviled eggs because I had found out that the word deviled for food originated in the 1780s. Now, um, people who study language say that before a word is written down, it tends to exist being spoken more. So people tend to think that this might be something from the 1770s originally. And it means a food that's heavily spiced, and I'm talking hot spicy. It's devilish. It's a deviled egg. Um, but the, food, the word deviled for food is not applied to eggs until around the, the 1800s, the later 1800s. But we do have a recipe uh, that we make in the kitchen office from a French cookbook that translates to eggs minced without malice, where you take out the egg yolk, you mix it with cream, some spices, not hot spices, um, and some greens from the garden, and you fill the eggs. And it looks very much like a deviled egg. It tastes similar to a deviled egg. Um, in fact, there's recipes for these stuffed eggs going all the way back to the 12th, uh, 12th century that uh, comes from a Sp Andalusian, a Sp now in modern Spain, cookbook. But we won't get our deviled egg recipe until the 1940s. Part of the reason is because we need mayonnaise. Now, mayonnaise was invented in 1756 to celebrate the Battle um, of Mayon, um, but mayonnaise is not commercially available in the United States until 1907, and it's 1940 before it's the main binder in a deviled egg. Move right along to, we're going to finish with three beverages. The first is beef tea. Now, beef tea is a restorative drink. Think of it like 18th century bone broth. People realize that people who have meat can be a little bit more healthy, and what is the essence of what is inside beef that helps give you them vigor, vitality, energy? Um, in the 18th century, we don't know about vitamins and protein is not understood great. And so what they would do is take thin slices of beef, put it in a jar, fill it up with hot water, set it near the fire until the water is what they call new milk warm or blood warm. Basically, if, you, if it's about the temperature that you could put it in a bottle and give it to a baby, uh, that's the temperature we're going for. Then they pull out the slices of beef and drink the, the water, the tea. We've steeped beef and made beef tea. Um, it was a way to try to help someone who wasn't feeling well get a little bit better. Now, if you have a cough, we'll probably give you something different. We'll have a special kind of beer with a nice chickeny kick to it. What they would do is they would cask up ale before they put the lid on the cask. They will take a rooster that has been um, killed, gutted, plucked, and boiled, throw, put him in a sack with spices and dried fruit, and toss him into the cask as well, set it to the side, and let it sit. Um, this drink was known as a good pectoral drink. That means for you know, chest ailments. Um, they said it was good for the consumption, which is uh, a period term for tuberculosis. So we're talking about chest difficulties. If you have a cold with a big cough, those sorts of things, we'll give you a nice hot cup of this chickeny beer. Now, by the 1770s, it's starting to fall out of fashion, um, but it was all the rage for a while. 
ladies, if you were a good housewife, you probably had this recipe kind of in your repertoire. And Tryon Palace has a manuscript cookbook, a handwritten cookbook that was passed down through a family. There are four different recipes for this drink in there, folks. Um, like I said, by 1770, which is the time period we tend to interpret here at the palace, uh, we are fading, this drink is fading in popularity. Um, however, there are hints of this drink possibly still around with us today. See, in the 18th century, it's known as cock ale, you know, rooster ale. Uh, but around the time that it fades out in the early 1800s, a new word is born. And a lot of linguists aren't exactly sure where it comes from. That word is cocktail. And there are some people who think that it may be a corruption of cock ale and getting new life in a new way. Now, the last food fact that I have for you, and one that most people are going to know a lot better than the last two drinks that I've talked about, is chocolate. In the 18th century, chocolate is drunk more than it's eaten. And what I have here are a bunch of cocoa beans. They are picked out of the cocoa pod. They are let to ferment and dry and then are roasted. And this is the inside. If you crush this up, this is the cocoa nibs that you might see at the grocery store and those sorts of things. We will take this, put it over heat, mix it with spices, and we'll come up with chocolate. Um, chocolate is pretty heavily spiced in the 18th century, and we have wonderful eating recipes for it. I have a recipe for Spanish, lo Spanish loaves, which is basically a dinner roll that has the outer crust um, grated off. It is soaked in sweet white wine, stuffed with a chocolate cream, and rolled in cinnamon and sugar. We've got uh, torte de chocolat, so chocolate custard tart. Um, they're all amazing, but most people are going to drink their chocolate in the 18th century. And just like when we talked about with coffee, there were a lot of different schools of thought because this is a relatively new drink. Um, it's the same way for chocolate. We do all agree that you're going to need a chocolate pot. They looked, there were different styles. This is one of the type. Um, this is going to be a lower class one because it's just redware. We'll fill this up with our beverage of choice, and that's where a lot of the discussion happens. Do you make hot chocolate with water? Do you make hot chocolate with milk? There's even advocates for making hot chocolate with red wine. We fill this up with the, the beverage. We put it on, on um, over hot coals and let it get nice and hot. We grate the chocolate in, and then we take our stick here. We put it in, and we rub, our, rub it between our hands, and it froths it up. It gets a nice, frothy, almost head to it, um, and then that is poured in. And I will say that a nice cup of 18th century hot chocolate is the most luxurious thing you can do to yourself on a cold, cold day. Uh, so those are the 10 food facts that I wanted to share with you today. They're some of my favorite ones. Um, is there any questions? We've got two questions. If you have any more, feel free to put them in. How do you know the cochineal beetles are all female? And why use only the female versus the male? Okay, so we've got a question about how do I know that every single one of these little ladies in here is a female? Why do we only use the females? Um, thankfully, I didn't have to do all the science behind that because people were so fascinated with cochineal beetles. Uh, Entomologists, bug scientists have studied them and have found that these colonies live, these colonies lay eggs, and there are these little winged guys that don't look really anything like the females that fly from colony to colony. And in science labs, and I don't know if it's over candlelit dinners as well, um, but we have been able to establish the fact that it's females who are the ones who are spending all their time hanging out on the nopal cactus leaves. And because they are stationary, they actually will cover themselves with what looks like a cobweb um, as part of their protection. And so another part of their protection is that carminic acid, which is what gives the, the cochineal that red color. From Rebecca, did the folks living there learn any recipes from Native Americans or mostly European recipes or New American ones? So uh, we've got a question about where do the recipes that we cook um, come from, uh, if they're Native American, if they're mostly European, those sorts of things. Um, we mostly cook European recipes here, a lot of English, some French. Um, we even break out a little bit of German in um, kind of honor of the 
founding of New Bern on occasion because we do know that some of those founding uh, families kept uh, records in German, so we know that there's still a bit of a German influence even in the 18th century. Um, we use ingredients that come from uh, the, the native uh, populations that are here, and we also use foods that were introduced by the enslaved populations here. Food is interesting in the fact that it does one of two things. It either comes in low and climbs up, which is really hard for things for a food to do. If a food is associated with some, uh, a people group that in whatever time period they are, they're thought of as less than, it's harder for that food to climb up and gain social acceptance. However, if it's a new food that all of the rich people are eating, everybody wants a bit of that and it tends to go down the social ladder a lot easier. Um, so that actually makes it harder sometimes to find recipes that use ingredients that were introduced by these marginalized communities. Although we try to do that, um, we'll, we see that um, the Tuscarora, uh, the native population that was here when uh, Newburn was founded, did have corn. We use cornmeal in some of our recipes, um, Indian puddings. Uh, are called Indian puddings because they use cornmeal, which is not something that the Europeans are using a whole lot of. Um, they also, we know that kidney beans were popular with them, and Europeans were using kidney beans. So we were able to kind of pull in from that. Unfortunately, I am always looking for more recipes that use some of the uh, representations of all the people who made Newburn great. Uh, to help tell that story here in the kitchen office. I just There's not always, as far as I am aware, of the, the actual recipes for that, but I'm always looking, and if anybody has any, by all means, feel free to uh, submit them to me. I'm always looking. Any, anything else? All right, well, thank you guys. If you're watching this after we've you know, ended and you have a question, please put it in the comments. Those questions will get to me, and I am happy to answer them for you. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you later.